Hello and welcome. We're thrilled to have you here with us today. Now, if you were to just glance at the headlines churned out by certain, let's call them optimistic economists, you might think the American economy is doing swimmingly. They paint a picture of prosperity and growth, pointing to low unemployment numbers like a toddler showing you their half-eaten crayon drawing of a dog. Look, it's a thriving economy. They cry, seemingly oblivious to the fact that the dog only has three legs and appears to be melting. It's a facade, a mirage of stability. But here in the real world where the rest of us reside, things feel a bit more, let's say, precarious. The reality is far more complex and unsettling. It's like walking on a luxuriously carpeted floor, only to realize halfway across that there's a very real chance you're about to plummet into a very deep, very uncarpeted basement. The ground beneath us is not as solid as it seems. Over the next few minutes, or however long it takes to unpack this economic dumpster fire, we're going to delve into 15 glaring signs that the American economy is not just teetering on the edge, but possibly doing a little jig as it prepares to take the plunge. It's a dance with danger, a flirtation with disaster. From skyrocketing debt to the slow, agonizing demise of the classic American diner, we're going to examine the cracks in the facade and ask the tough questions, like, how did we get here? What decisions led us down this path? And can someone please pass the antacids, because I think I'm having a stress-induced reflux episode? Buckle up, folks. It's going to be a bumpy ride. We're in for a journey through the ups and downs, the twists and turns of our economic landscape. We'll revisit past economic crises, drawing parallels and learning from history. We'll listen to the voices of everyday Americans, those who feel the impact of economic policies firsthand. We'll hear from small business owners struggling to keep their doors open, facing challenges that numbers alone can't convey. We'll sit at the dinner tables of families discussing their finances, their hopes, and their fears for the future. And we'll weigh the opinions of experts, those who see the economy from different angles, offering contrasting views. We'll witness the protests, the demands for change, the voices calling for a better, more equitable system. But we'll also see the sparks of innovation, the startups and entrepreneurs who are finding new ways to thrive. We'll explore community efforts, people coming together to support one another in times of need. Because at the heart of it all, the economy is about people. It's about us, our lives, our futures. So as we embark on this journey, let's keep an open mind and a hopeful heart. The road may be rough, but together we can navigate it. We'll travel across the country, from bustling cities to quiet towns, uncovering the true state of our economy. And we'll look for solutions, ways to build a stronger, more resilient economy for everyone. Because in the end, it's not just about numbers and charts. It's about creating a future where everyone can thrive. So let's get started. The journey ahead is challenging, but it's also filled with opportunities. Let's explore them together. Our first stop on this economic tour de force is the world of consumer loans and spoiler alert, things aren't looking so hot. In fact, they're looking about as financially sound as a chocolate fire guard. Delinquency rates on everything from credit cards to car loans are currently doing their best impression of a caffeinated squirrel, meaning they're going up and fast. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the thrilling world of financial jargon, delinquency basically means people are struggling to pay back their debts. And when I say struggling, I mean they're currently engaged in a knockdown drag out brawl with their bank accounts and the bank accounts are winning. This trend should be setting off alarm bells louder than a flock of pigeons trapped in a symbol factory because it suggests that Americans are increasingly stretched thin, financially speaking. It's like trying to stretch a single slice of cheese over an entire pizza. It might cover the bare minimum, but it's not going to be pretty and someone's going to end up with tomato sauce on their face. Now, let's move on to another indicator flashing brighter than a Christmas tree in Times Square, the commercial real estate market. More specifically, the office sector, which is currently experiencing all the excitement of a deserted Chuck E. Cheese on a Tuesday afternoon. See, the pandemic, in all its germ-ridden glory, forced many companies to embrace the wonderful, pajama-filled world of remote work. And while working from home might sound like a dream come true, no more commuting, no more uncomfortable office attire, no more awkward water cooler conversations. It's turned out to be a bit of a nightmare for the commercial real estate market. Because, as it turns out, when you don't need thousands of square feet of office space, you tend not to pay for it. Who knew? 
And this mass exodus from office buildings has left landlords with a lot of empty space and a whole lot of unanswered questions, mostly revolving around, what are we going to do with all this empty space? And should we invest in a really good office plant to try and lure people back? So, we've talked about delinquencies on loans and the commercial real estate apocalypse brewing. Fun times, right? But have you walked down your street lately and noticed something missing? No, not your will to live, though that might be dwindling too. I'm talking about bank branches. They're vanishing faster than common sense in a political debate. In the first few weeks of June 2024 alone, 51 branches win. That's like banks are playing a morbid game of whack-a-mole, except instead of moles, it's your access to cash and that free lollipop you pretend not to want. Over 400 locations have already closed their doors this year. It's enough to make you wonder if tellers are being trained for a career in escapology. Wood Forest National Bank, for example, has shuttered 29 branches. Bank of America, a name synonymous with big banking, has axed nine branches. And this isn't just a blip, folks. It's a trend. Banks argue it's because of online banking, but I have a sneaking suspicion they just don't like looking at our disappointed faces when we check our balances. Remember when job security was a thing? Me neither. But lately, it feels like the job market is playing a cruel game of musical chairs, and there aren't enough chairs to go around. Case in point, U.S. Logistics Solutions. They recently announced a shutdown, leaving 2,000 workers in the lurch. That's 2,000 families facing an uncertain future. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's just one company. And you'd be right. But it's part of a much larger and frankly terrifying trend. Layoffs are becoming more common than a Kardashian marriage. Tech companies are slashing jobs, manufacturing is slowing down, and even the once-booming service industry is feeling the pinch. Remember when the biggest problem facing restaurants was finding a decent waiter who wouldn't judge your order of mozzarella sticks as an appetizer and a main course? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Because these days, restaurants are facing a whole new menu of challenges, and it's not pretty. Even Hooters, a place seemingly designed to weather any economic storm, is feeling the heat. They recently closed nearly 40 underperforming locations. That's right, folks. Even places promising delightfully tacky yet unrefined experiences are struggling. And if those bastions of chicken wings and questionable uniforms are struggling, what hope is there for the rest of the industry? Remember Bob's stores? That bastion of discount furniture and questionable home decor? Yeah, well, they've gone the way of the dinosaurs, folks. Filed for Chapter 11. And they're not alone. Eastern Mountain Sports, the place you bought your overpriced fleece jacket, joined them in bankruptcy court. Now, you might be thinking, John, those stores were relics of a bygone era. Who shops there anymore? And to that, I say, fair point. But here's the thing. Their demise is a symptom of a much larger problem, the relentless march of the retail apocalypse. These bankruptcies are like canaries in the coal mine, except instead of canaries, it's struggling retailers dropping like flies, and instead of a coal mine, it's the American economy. Remember that time when you could fill up your gas tank without having to take out a second mortgage? Ah, those were the days. Because now, my friends, we're living in an era of skyrocketing costs, where everything from gasoline to groceries seems to be engaged in a never-ending game of price limbo. And guess who's stuck playing? That's right, it's us, the American people. Let's start with the obvious gas prices. Since January 2021, the average price of gasoline in the United States has shot up by a whopping 45%. That's like walking into a gas station, filling up your tank, and then finding out that you owe them your firstborn child. And it's not just gas. Everything is getting more expensive. Electricity costs? Up 29%. Car prices? Up 20.4%. Car maintenance? Oh, that'll be 30.5% more, please. Remember the American dream. That quaint notion that if you work hard and play by the rules, you too can achieve prosperity and own a home. Well, it seems that dream has been put on hold, folks, indefinitely. Because in today's economy, owning a home is about as attainable as riding a unicorn to work. Since 2020, housing costs have skyrocketed by an absurd 47%. That's right, 47%. That's like trying to buy a used car and finding out that the dealer has decided to charge you extra for the air and the tires. And don't even get me started on mortgage rates. Remember when mortgage rates were hovering around a measly 2.77%? 
Well, those days are long gone. Now, thanks to a delightful combination of inflation and economic uncertainty, mortgage rates have exploded to a whopping 6.99%. That's a 152% increase. It's enough to make you want to take out a mortgage on a cardboard box, except for the fact that you probably couldn't afford the monthly payments. So, we've talked about job losses, we've talked about the rising cost of living, but let's talk about what happens when those two delightful trends collide like drunk drivers at a demolition derby. The result is a catastrophic situation where the most basic human need, shelter, becomes unattainable for many. Imagine the stress and anxiety of losing your job, and then, as if that weren't enough, watching the cost of everything around you skyrocket. It's a perfect storm that leaves countless individuals and families teetering on the edge of homelessness. You get a situation where people can no longer afford the basic necessity of a roof over their heads. And it's not just happening in far-flung corners of the country. This is happening everywhere. From bustling metropolises to quiet suburban neighborhoods, the crisis is pervasive. The sight of people sleeping on sidewalks, in parks, or in their cars has become disturbingly common. It's a stark reminder that homelessness doesn't discriminate. It can affect anyone, anywhere. Take Chicago, for example, a city known for its deep dish pizza and its even deeper pockets of economic disparity. The Windy City, with its iconic skyline and vibrant culture, is also a microcosm of the broader issue. Here, the gap between the wealthy and the poor is glaringly evident. While some enjoy the luxuries of high-rise living, others struggle to find a safe place to sleep at night. In just one year, the number of homeless people in Chicago has tripled to a staggering 18,800. This isn't just a number. It's a reflection of thousands of individual stories of hardship and resilience. Each person in that statistic has a unique story. Stories of lost jobs, medical emergencies, and unaffordable housing. The shelters are overflowing, and the lines for food assistance are growing longer by the day. Now, I'm no mathematician, but tripling a number is generally considered bad, it's a clear indicator that something is fundamentally wrong. When you see such a dramatic increase, it's not just a blip on the radar. It's a full-blown crisis that demands immediate attention and action. It's like failing a math test and then finding out your score is actually three times worse. Imagine the shock and despair of realizing that the problem is far more severe than you initially thought. It's a wake-up call that we can't afford to ignore. Think about the human cost here. These aren't just numbers on a spreadsheet. These are real people, with real lives who are facing unimaginable hardships. Families are being torn apart, children are growing up without stability, and individuals are losing hope. Huh? The emotional and psychological toll is immense. These are people, families, individuals who are struggling to survive, sleeping on the streets, and relying on the kindness of strangers or, often, the overstretched resources of already strained social services. The social safety nets that are supposed to catch them are fraying under the pressure. Volunteers and social workers are doing their best, but the demand far exceeds the supply. This isn't just a statistic. It's a stark and frankly depressing indictment of where we are as a society. It's a reflection of our collective failure to address the root causes of homelessness, whether it's the lack of affordable housing, inadequate mental health services, or the widening income gap. We need to ask ourselves, how did we get here? And more importantly, how do we fix it? And let's be clear, Chicago is not alone. This is a nationwide issue that affects cities and towns across the country. From the East Coast to the West Coast, and everywhere in between, the story is the same. The faces may be different, but the struggles are eerily similar. This is a national crisis. It's not confined to one region or demographic. It's a pervasive problem that requires a coordinated, comprehensive response. We need to come together as a nation to address this issue head on. It's not just about providing temporary relief. It's about creating sustainable solutions that address the root causes of homelessness. Cities and towns across America are grappling with a surge in homelessness, from the sprawling tent size of Los Angeles to the makeshift shelters tucked away in the shadows of gleaming skyscrapers in New York City. The contrast is jarring. Luxury apartments and high-end stores, just a stone's throw away from people living in tents and makeshift shelters. It's a visual representation of the growing divide in our society. We need to bridge this gap and ensure that everyone has access to safe, affordable housing. The time for action is now. All right, 
Let's move on to a demographic that's often sold a very specific vision of retirement. Sipping lemonade on a porch swing, yelling at squirrels to get off their lawn, and generally enjoying the fruits of their labor. But for a growing number of older Americans, retirement is looking less like a relaxing stroll into the sunset and more like a frantic scramble to avoid financial ruin. You see, 44% of retired Americans are actually considering rejoining the workforce. Now, I'm not saying that working later in life is inherently bad. Some people genuinely enjoy their jobs and want to stay active. But when nearly half of retirees are contemplating dusting off their resumes, it's a clear sign that something is deeply, deeply wrong. Let's be honest, folks. Nobody dreams of spending their golden years flipping burgers, folding sweaters, or worse, back in their old office navigating the soul-crushing monotony of spreadsheets and conference calls. They deserve to enjoy their retirement, not be forced back into the workforce because their fixed incomes are being ravaged by the relentless beast that is inflation. Now, let's talk about consumer confidence, which, in many ways, is the canary in the coal mine of our economy. When people feel confident about the future, they spend money, businesses thrive, and everyone wins, except for maybe the coal mine canaries, who are still, you know, stuck in a coal mine. But when consumer confidence plummets like a poorly aimed souffle, it's a sign that people are worried about the economy, and rightfully so, given what we've discussed so far. And let me tell you, folks, consumer confidence is about as low as a limbo champion after a particularly aggressive growth spurt. A recent survey found that a whopping 58% of Americans believe the economy is weak. That's more than half the country, which, last I checked, is a lot. It's like asking people if they prefer puppies or kittens, and then finding out that a majority chose tax audits. It's just not a good sign. And if that weren't bad enough, only 34% of Americans believe the economy is on the right track. That's less than the approval rating of a politician who was caught on camera trying to sell national secrets for a lifetime supply of mayonnaise. It's abysmal. All right. Let's talk about economic indicators, those flashing red lights on the dashboard of America. You know, the kind that make economists go, hmm, that's not great. One particularly ominous indicator is the Dallas Fed Services Index. Now, this index tracks the health of the service sector, which, let's be honest, is basically the entire U.S. economy these days. And guess what? This index has been in negative territory for 25 straight months. That's like going to the doctor for a cough and finding out you've actually had bronchitis since the Biden administration took office. Now, if there's one group that really feels the pulse of the American economy, it's small business owners. They're the backbone of this country, the scrappy entrepreneurs who chase the American dream with the tenacity of a squirrel trying to bury a nut in a concrete patio. But lately, that entrepreneurial spirit has been feeling a little deflated. A recent survey found that a whopping 67% of small business owners are fearful about the current economic conditions. That's right, two-thirds. You know things are bad when even the eternally optimistic small business owners are losing sleep. And it's not hard to see why they're worried. Rising inflation, supply chain disruptions, and a looming recession are enough to make even the most seasoned entrepreneur break out in a cold sweat. Imagine trying to run a bakery when the price of flour has doubled. Your delivery driver is stuck in traffic caused by a pothole the size of a small car, and nobody has enough disposable income to buy a croissant, let alone a whole cake. It's enough to make you want to chuck it all in and become a survivalist, living off the grid and bartering for essential goods with whatever you can scrounge up. Except, of course, even survivalists need to buy their seeds and ammunition from somewhere, and those prices are going up too. But let's take a step back and really understand the depth of these concerns. Small business owners are not just worried about their immediate financial health. They're also concerned about the long-term viability of their businesses. And many of them have invested their life savings, countless hours, and immeasurable amounts of energy into building something from the ground up. They've weathered storms before, but this time feels different. The uncertainty is palpable. Financial advisors are being consulted more frequently, and long-term plans are being scrutinized and revised. The question on everyone's mind is, how long can we sustain this? Community meetings have become a common sight, with local business owners coming together to discuss strategies and share resources. There's a sense of camaraderie, but also a shared anxiety. 
Many are turning to loans and financial aid, but even that comes with its own set of challenges. The application process can be daunting, and the approval rates are not always favorable. Yet, amidst all this, there are small victories. A loyal customer returning, a successful social media campaign, or even just a good day of sales can provide a much-needed morale boost. Some are even finding ways to adapt and innovate. Training new employees, expanding services, or pivoting to online sales are just a few examples of how small businesses are trying to stay afloat. Workshops and training sessions are being attended with renewed vigor. The focus is on acquiring new skills and knowledge that can help navigate these turbulent times. Community support has also been a beacon of hope. Local residents are making a conscious effort to shop at small businesses, understanding that their patronage can make a significant difference. Despite the challenges, there's a glimmer of hope. Small business owners are resilient, and their determination to succeed is unwavering. They are the heart and soul of the American economy, and their perseverance is a testament to the indomitable spirit of entrepreneurship. So, the next time you walk past a small business, remember the struggles and triumphs that lie behind those doors. Every purchase, every word of encouragement, and every act of support can help keep the dream alive. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about surviving, it's about thriving. And with a little help from their communities, small business owners can continue to chase their dreams and contribute to the vibrant tapestry of the American economy. And if you thought things couldn't get any worse, buckle up because they found a way. Remember all those rosy economic forecasts we were promised? Turns out they were about as reliable as a weather report from a fortune cookie. Since October of last year, those consumer confidence readings we talked about, yeah, they've been revised downward which, in layman's terms, means someone looked back at the numbers and said, oh dear God, we were far too optimistic. Now, you might think, okay, so they got the numbers a bit wrong. What's the big deal? Well, imagine trying to bake a cake with the wrong measurements. You might end up with a pile of inedible goo instead of a delicious treat. That's kind of what's happening with our economy. These revisions mean that the data used to make crucial economic decisions, you know, the kind that affect things like interest rates and government spending, well, that data's been about as accurate as a toddler trying to throw darts blindfolded. Now, we've thrown a lot of numbers at you, and trust me, no one's enjoying it more than me. But it's important to remember that behind all these statistics, behind the percentages and the economic jargon, are real people. And the unfortunate truth is, those people are hurting. We're not just talking about a few points on a graph here. We're talking about a growing number of Americans facing impossible choices every single day. Choices like whether to pay their rent or put food on the table, or whether to fill a vital prescription or keep the lights on. So, there you have it. 15 signs that the American dream, that shining beacon of hope and prosperity, might be in danger of becoming a mirage. From soaring costs and stagnant wages to a housing market that's less of a ladder and more of a cruel joke, the evidence is hard to ignore. But here's the good news. It's not too late. We can still turn this ship around, but it's going to take all of us. It's going to take demanding better from our leaders, holding them accountable for their actions, and refusing to settle for anything less than a fair and just economy. Stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, stay angry. Because the only way we're going to get through this is together. And honestly, the alternative is just too depressing to contemplate.